On the 8th of November 1990, at the 449th session of the Italian Senate, the then Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti revealed the existence of a secret organization that had been operating in Italy and other Western European countries for more than four decades. This is how the general public first heard about Operation Gladio. Gladio was the codename given to the Italian section of a large Stay Behind network created by US security services in cooperation with several European countries, including the UK, Belgium, France, Greece, West Germany, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and the Netherlands. The purpose of this operation was to set up a covert network of elite fighting units. In case of an invasion of Western Europe by forces of the Communist bloc, these groups would immediately organize the resistance against the invaders by waging guerrilla war. I'm your host David, and this week we are going to look at the creation and plans for the US Stay Behind actions in the event of a Soviet attack in Europe. This is the Cold War. As revealed by Andriotti, the Italian operation was kicked off by a 1951 memo by the head of the intelligence services of the armed forces to the chief of staff, in which he, quote, proposed the creation of an organization to gather intelligence and to conduct sabotage operations on the national territory in case of enemy occupation, end quote. Andriotti admitted that at its height, Gladio could count on 622 operatives. The criteria for recruitment was physical fitness, appropriate military experience, loyalty to the Republic institutions, and their perceived ability to escape deportation or internment in case of a communist invasion. Selected operatives were trained in a secret facility near the seaside town of Alghero, Sardinia. Alghero boasts sandy beaches with clear waters, stunning medieval churches, great food, and an average high of 14 degrees Celsius in February. You can actually sign me up for that anytime. But anyway, Gladio personnel were trained in guerrilla tactics and exfiltration techniques. They were then assigned to posts in northeastern Italy, regions most likely to be invaded first. There, they had access to 139 secret weapons caches to be used also as rallying points to recruit a more sizable resistance force after the invasion. Now, although the Italian Gladio was the first NATO-sponsored clandestine army to be revealed, hence why the name stuck with the general public, becoming synonymous with the whole operation, it actually wasn't the first to be created. The 1951 memo I referenced also clarified that similar stay-behind networks had already been readied in other allied countries. However, Italy does boast some interesting dry runs for the full operation. But you know what, before I get there, let's trace the precedents that inspired the creation of Gladio. The Stay Behind model was similar to the resistance and partisan organizations that had fought against the Axis in the Second World War, but with an important difference regarding supplies. The French resistance, as an example, had to rely on Allied paradrops or stealing weapons from the German occupiers. In the case of Gladio, however, NATO believed it safer to create an advanced secret weapons cache, ensuring their units would be well supplied from the get-go. The other difference is that partisan fighting units in the Second World War traditionally only originated after a country had been invaded by the Axis. There is one notable example, however, of a resistance movement that was pre-planned and which may have served as a model for future stay-behind networks. Back in July of 1940, the German High Command formulated the first plans for Operation Felix, the capture of Gibraltar. The plan was led by Admiral Willem Canaris, the head of the Abwehr, the secret service of the German military. The plan involved German troops entering Spain from the French border and then seizing Gibraltar from the north. Now, Canaris and his organization were known to oppose the Nazi regime and therefore the Admiral may have alerted the Allies to Operation Felix. The British Secret Service then launched an ambitious counter-operation to create a stay-behind network in Spain. Should the German army cross the Iberian Peninsula to take Gibraltar, they would be harassed by guerrilla units composed of anti-Francoist elements, trained and armed by the Allies. The name of the operation, by the way? Goldeneye. 
and the main coordinator on the ground? None other than Ian Fleming. Of course, Operation Felix never took place, and so Goldeneye did not materialize. Unless you count Fleming's Jamaican estate, or the 1995 Bond movie and subsequent N64 game. But back to our story. Planting resistance movements in advance of a foreign invasion was not a concept exclusive to the Allied side. Towards the end of the Third Reich, Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels was the main force behind Operation Werewolf. The plan was to train Hitler Youth members in guerrilla tactics. They would constitute a stay-behind network in charge of harassing Allied occupation armies after the inevitable fall of Berlin. Werewolf never fully achieved its objective. Special Forces officer and notable goon Otto Skorzeny took over the plan using what little network it had created to smuggle Nazi officials abroad. On the other hand, the NKVD learned about the plan and used it as a justification to execute about 5,000 Hitler Youth members, all under the age of 17. Now, at the onset of the Cold War, the Western and Soviet spheres of influence were divided along a clearly defined fault line, from Stettin to Trieste, to quote Winston Churchill. As we explored in our earlier special about Italy, this country was in a rather unique position, occupied by the Western Allies, but home to a strong Communist Party with access to both weapons and an intelligence network. A Communist uprising supported by a Soviet invasion was a concrete possibility and taken very seriously by the US Occupation Army. On the 14th of January 1947, Special Agent Nicholas Natsios of the US CIC, the Counterintelligence Corps, received a visit from one Giancarlo Luzzato, codenamed Scorpion. Luzzato claimed to have been an OSS informant and courier in 1944 and 1945. The Scorpion asked Natsios for details about the RAC, of which Natsios knew nothing about. According to the Italian informant, the RAC was a covert intervention group, composed of elements of the US Army, to be used in an emergency against communist revolutionary action. The report also mentions another group. The Scorpion claimed to be a member of the Italian Liberation Army, or AIL, Armata Italiana de Liberazione. At its peak, the AIL could rely on 120,000 members, mainly current or former armed forces personnel with a nationalist, neo-fascist, and anti-communist agenda. Their aim was to stage a counter-insurrection in case of communist takeover of the country, and alongside other smaller neo-fascist groups, it enjoyed close supervision from the head of the CIC in Italy. Now, a report of the Italian police, dated the 16th of September 1946, states that the members of such organizations are in constant contact with American authorities which have confirmed their support to the movement. US support to a former fascist military was not news in the autumn of 1946. As early as May of the same year, the OSS had allegedly facilitated the evasion of commandos of the 10th Flotilla MAS from a POW camp in Toronto, southern Italy. The MAS were the special forces of the Royal Italian Navy, protagonists of daring raids against Allied shipping in the Second World War. Even as early as April 1945, the OSS had helped their commander, Prince Junio Valerio Borghese, escape capture by disguising him as an American officer. The overall intent was to maintain MAS operatives as potential anti-communist assets. These dangerous liaisons between the OSS, the CIC, and neo-fascists are well documented, although they are not conclusive proof that they constituted the first formal incarnations of the Italian Gladio. The onset of clandestine networks in other European countries is thankfully more clear-cut and allows to trace the progress of the whole operation. Since the end of 1944, the British and US governments were aligned on the importance of keeping Western Europe free of communism. They considered exploiting the experience and strategies of the SOE, the Special Operations Executive, to start planning clandestine networks in Western Europe. The first major operations were set up in Britain and France in 1948 and 1949. British Secret Services had created a facility in Port Moncton, Portsmouth, to train the operatives of clandestine organizations in Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium. At the beginning of the following year, the head of the British SIS, Sir Stuart Menzies, created the WUCC, 
Western Union Clandestine Committee, based in France with the aim to coordinate secret unorthodox warfare. With the creation of NATO in April of that year, the WUCC was merged into the Military Alliance and renamed the Clandestine Planning Committee. Now, despite the stay-behind operation being an integral part of NATO, it soon expanded to include neutral countries. This came under the initiative of CIA agent William Colby, based at the agency station in Stockholm. Colby initiated the creation and training of clandestine armies in neutral Sweden and Finland, as well as NATO members Norway and Denmark. One key theatre of the Cold War was, of course, West Germany. This territory was home to its own stay-behind army, the Bund Deutscher Jugend, or BDJ, and more specifically its paramilitary organization, the Technischer Dienst, the TD. The founder of the BDJ was Dr. Paul Leuth, author of the 1980s of Health Through Vitamin C, but in the 1950s he was interested in other pursuits. A CIA report of February 1952 states, The BDJ is already at present one of the most potent mechanisms for political warfare purposes. In fact, it is the only mass organization through which we can carry out a wide variety of assignments by issuing direct orders. The BDJ included among its ranks several former Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS officers. One of them, Hans Otto, revealed the existence of the organization to the Frankfurt police. In the subsequent raid of BDJ premises, police found evidence that the organization had been receiving a monthly subsidy of about 50,000 US dollars from US intelligence services. A later CIA report in April 1953 summarizes a white paper on the BDJ and the TD issued by the Western German Social Democratic Party, or SPD. The SPD claims that the true aims of Dr. Leuth's organization lay in domestic political goals, in other words, subverting the democratic government in favor of a more authoritarian regime. Okay, we'll now go back to the beginning of our story, the speech by Italian Prime Minister Andreotti. His big reveal did not actually come out of the blue. It was spurred by an ongoing investigation which was trying to shed light on an event that had taken place in 1972. This was the assassination by bomb of three Carbonari, Italian gendarmerie officers, on the 31st of May. The inquiry, led by Magistrate Felice Casson, identified the perpetrator as a right-wing terrorist, Vincenzo Vicinguera. According to Casson, the explosives used came from one of the Gladio weapons caches. This clearly points to a connection between the stay-behind operatives and the perpetration of criminal activities, even state-sponsored terrorism. Almost immediately after Andreotti had finished his speech, senators from the opposition expressed their suspicions that Gladio, in the absence of an external invasion, may have been used to achieve internal policy goals. Almost the same expression used by the SPD decades prior. The implication was that Gladio was implicated in the so-called strategy of tension. This involved carrying out terror attacks, sometimes false flag attacks, to isolate extremists, especially left-wing, and consolidate central authority. Author Daniele Ganser supports this claim in his book NATO's Secret Armies, Operation Gladio, and Terrorism in Western Europe. The theory is disputed, however, as Ganser bases his conclusion on documents which may actually be KGB forgeries. But I feel like I'm revealing too much ahead of time. As we progress in our series on Operation Gladio, we will explore these claims and try to find the truth behind stay behind. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have a press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're also active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support would be greatly appreciated via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. This is the Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.